third module of this program, we will discuss the diagnosis and management of apnea of prematurity. Your learning objectives for this module are to understand how apnea of prematurity is currently diagnosed, the interventions and therapies used to treat apnea of prematurity, and discharge considerations for infants with a history of apnea of prematurity. Corresponding research to support therapies will be discussed where appropriate. It's important to note that great variability exists in the documentation, diagnosis, management, and discharge procedures for infants with apnea of prematurity. Therefore, it's important for you to know your own institutional policies and the research which supports them. The use of oximetry may detect apneic events that cardiorespiratory monitoring can miss. However, misinterpretation of clinical findings at the bedside will influence which events are documented in the patient record and can influence both the diagnosis of apnea of prematurity and discharge timing. All infants born less than 35 weeks gestation should have cardiorespiratory monitoring for apnea, bradycardia, and desaturation events while hospitalized in a NICU. While there is a lack of consensus on what actually constitutes a significant cardiorespiratory event, most practitioners use the definitions listed in Module 1 as being significant and requiring continued observation and possible treatment. To review, the definition of significant apnea is an apneic event lasting greater than or equal to 20 seconds or a shorter breathing pause that is associated with heart rates of 80 to 100 and or oxygen desaturations to less than 80 to 85%. Without clear evidence of the extent of morbidity that can be attributed to apnea of prematurity, clinicians treat it under the assumption of presumed harm without intervention. Treatments for apnea of prematurity are somewhat limited and can have side effects. Interventions for apnea of prematurity include preventative strategies, medication, and positive pressure techniques. Treatments should be considered when apneic events are frequent, prolonged, associated with significant bradycardia, or require intervention such as tactile stimulation or positive pressure ventilation. Preventative strategies include the avoidance of extreme flexion or extension of the neck to maintain patency of the upper airway, the provision of a stable thermal environment as temperature fluctuations can lead to apnea, maintenance of nasal patency as infants are obligate nasal breathers, and lastly, avoidance of hypoxia, which can lead to severe desaturation episodes. At this time, there is no clear consensus on goal saturations for preterm infants, but avoidance of saturations less than 88% is generally agreed upon. Methylxanthines have been the pharmacologic treatment of apnea of prematurity for decades. This class of medication has multiple effects on respiration. These include increased minute ventilation, improved CO2 sensitivity, decreased periodic breathing, decreased hypoxic respiratory depression, and improved diaphragmatic contractility. These drugs also have a weak diuretic effect and may improve lung compliance. The primary mechanism of action is thought to be blockade of inhibitory adenosine A1 receptors, which leads to excitation of respiratory neural output, and adenosine A2A receptors, which are located on GABA neurons. Both caffeine and theophylline are used, but caffeine citrate is preferred because of its longer half-life, higher therapeutic index, and lack of need for drug-level monitoring. Adverse events include tachycardia, cardiac arrhythmias, emesis, jitteriness, increased metabolic demand, and feeding intolerance. Based on a 2010 Cochrane review by Henderson Smart and DiPaolo, caffeine therapy is recommended for all infants born less than or equal to 28 weeks gestation. Some clinicians advocate for treating all infants between 29 and 32 weeks as well, because most of these infants will have apneic events. Beyond 32 weeks of gestation, clinical practice varies in regards to caffeine therapy. The largest trial of caffeine therapy is the Caffeine for Apnea of Prematurity, or the CAP trial. This study, published in 2006 in the New England Journal of Medicine, randomly assigned 2,006 infants with birth weights of 500 to 1,250 grams to receive either caffeine citrate or placebo in the first 10 days of life to prevent or treat apnea of of prematurity or to facilitate extubation. Caffeine-treated infants had a shorter duration of mechanical ventilation, lower incidence of BPD, and improved neurodevelopmental outcomes at 18 months. 
It's important to note that differences in neurodevelopmental outcome were less evident at five years of age in study participants, but did favor the caffeine-treated subjects. The CAP trial did not collect data on the frequency of apneic events and therefore could not directly address the effect of caffeine on apnea. However, the data indicate that caffeine therapy, as used in this trial, is safe and may have additional health and neurodevelopmental benefits by additional uncharacterized mechanisms. There are no clear guidelines for when to discontinue caffeine and no trials to date have addressed when to discontinue caffeine therapy. Most clinicians discontinue caffeine around 33 to 34 weeks postmenstrual age if the infant has been apnea-free for greater than or equal to seven days. Because of the variability of when apnea resolves in individual patients, the use of a specific gestational age as the time to discontinue therapy may result in unnecessarily continuing caffeine therapy in some patients. Timely discontinuation of caffeine is important to avoid delays in discharge. Because of the half-life of caffeine is quite long, infants should be monitored for several days after discontinuation of the drug to ensure that infants remain apnea-free. Non-invasive positive pressure strategies such as nasal CPAP, synchronized NIPPV, and nasal cannula, splint open airways, and decrease atelectasis and VQ mismatch, improve oxygenation, and reduce apneic events. Splinting open the upper airway also decreases the risk of obstructive apnea. CPAP may also decrease the severity and duration of desaturation during central apneic events by facilitating the maintenance of a higher end expiratory lung volume. If apnea leads to severe cardiorespiratory instability, intubation and mechanical ventilation may be required. Other reported therapies, both invasive and non-invasive, have been used to treat apnea of prematurity with varying success. Several non-invasive options thought to bolster CNS activity include olfactory stimulation, mechanosensory stimulation, and sound stimulation in the form of music. However, all of these lacked prospective randomized control trials at this time. Red blood cell transfusions are theorized to increase respiratory drive by increasing oxygen carrying capacity, total oxygen content in the blood, and tissue oxygenation. While one study showed decreased apnea for three days after blood transfusion compared to the prior three days in a study of 76 preterm infants, there are no data to indicate that blood transfusions result in any long-term reduction in apnea. In many units, reflux is treated because of a belief that reflux events can precipitate apnea. The proposed mechanism is laryngeal chemoreflux. Despite the frequent coexistence of apnea and reflux in preterm infants, no studies definitively identify a link between reflux and apnea, and pharmacotherapy of reflux does not prevent apnea of prematurity. It's important to note that recent data suggest harmful effects of medication to reduce gastric acidity, as it can be associated with an increased incidence of neck, late-onset sepsis, and death. Practice and management surrounding discharge decisions for infants with apnea of prematurity varies widely. Decisions to discharge are usually based on nursing observations and documentation of clinical apneic events, which may not be accurate. Most physicians require an infant to be event-free for a period of time prior to discharge. The length of event-free time prior to discharge is also variable. A retrospective cohort study of 1,400 infants by Lorch et al. reported that a 5-7 to seven day apneic-free period successfully predicted resolution of apnea in 94-96% to 96% of cases. The success rates were lower for infants born at younger gestational ages, as can be seen in the graphs on the right, with success rates of being event-free on the y-axis and time and days on the x-axis. The top and bottom graphs show success rates for apnea or bradycardia-free intervals, respectively. The lower the gestational age, the less likely the infant is to have event-free survival at 5 to 7 days. A 95% success rate was not reached until 13 days for infants born less than 26 weeks. The available studies suggest that a specified event-free period prior to discharge does not need to be uniform and can be based on gestational age. Unfortunately, optimal timing for discharge from the hospital for a preterm infant who had apnea of prematurity remains unresolved. The fear of a former preterm infant dying at home from SIDS continues to drive the home monitor industry. There is no evidence to date that has been able to directly attribute a resolved diagnosis of apnea of prematurity with an increased risk for SIDS 
or that home monitors can prevent SIDS in former preterm patients. In infants born between 24 and 28 weeks gestation, the mean postmenstrual age for SIDS is about 47 weeks, compared with 53 to 54 weeks in infants born at term. Apnea of prematurity resolves at a postmenstrual age before most SIDS deaths occur. While infants born prematurely do have a higher incidence of SIDS, no evidence to date can support a causal link with apnea of prematurity. Therefore, routine home monitoring for preterm infants with resolved apnea of prematurity is not recommended by the AAP. Home cardiorespiratory monitoring after discharge, home from the NICU, may be prescribed for some preterm infants with a prolonged course of recurrent and extreme apnea, which is relatively uncommon. In this module, we discussed the diagnosis of apnea of prematurity and reviewed proposed interventions and treatments for apnea of prematurity. We concluded with a consideration of discharge criteria for infants with a history of apnea of prematurity. This concludes Module 3. We would like to acknowledge the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Organization of Neonatology Training Program Directors, Neo Reviews, and Abbott Nutrition for their support of this educational program. This concludes this module.